Excuse me. Hello, folks. How is everybody? We're going to be getting started here very, very shortly. So if everybody could take their seats, and we'd appreciate it if you come toward the front and fill in the middle. This is being broadcast live. Um, just a few ground rules. If everybody could just quickly pay attention, I'd appreciate it. Uh, please turn off your cell phones if they're on. Um, uh, this is, like I said, live for television, so we will pick up rings and whatnot, and that would be helpful not to have them on. The other thing is I will be moving around with the microphone um, to let folks ask their questions of our panel. And um, if you have a follow-up question, please make sure that I'm back with the microphone with you. Don't, don't start talking unless the microphone is with you because we are airing this for television and no one will hear what you have to say. So if you want to qu ask a question, all we need to see is a couple of fingers up. I'll acknowledge you. We'll let you know when we're coming to you. Like I said, we have to move around the room a lot. So if I walk past you, doesn't mean you're not going to get to ask your question. So just be patient. We have an hour and a half or two hours. So we're going to be getting ready to start very shortly, and thank you so much for coming out tonight.
Stand by, folks. We're going to be starting shortly. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for coming to the fourth community meeting hosted by the county executive to get community input on a draft zoning text amendment to address deployment of small antennas in our community. My name is Mitsuko Herrera. I am the Ultra Montgomery Program Director, and I handle policy, planning, and special technology projects. With me tonight, we have Joy Nurmi, who is Special Assistant to County Executive Isaiah Leggett. Jerry Lederer, who is our outside legal counsel from Best Best and Krieger on telecommunications issues. And Andrew Afflerback, who is the CEO and Director of Engineering for CTC Energy and Technology, who are engineering consultants for us. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out. I know that there's a football game that's starting this evening, so I appreciate you taking your time. I know that there's some of you at home that are doing that. We are planning to go live tonight from 7 to 9 p.m., so we will have a hard stop. The, um, the, uh, the uh, video of the meeting will be available. We are also streaming live on the internet, Facebook, and YouTube. So what we'd like to do for tonight's meeting, if we could go to the PowerPoint slide deck that is going to appear on this screen. Um, what I'd like to do is to give a brief update uh, answer and then try to hold the bulk of the meeting to answer resident questions. And what we're going to do is have you raise your hand. Because we are uh, recording this, you need to wait until Susan Kennedy, who is our host, uh, is going to come to you and she's going to hold the microphone so that we get good sound and the people at home and later can hear your question. And then we may, at certain points, depending on how it goes, ask for people who may have questions in the same topic so that we can kind of try to handle, address different issues as they come up. OK? So with that, if we have the PowerPoint. OK. So um, I think that's what we're going to handle. Next slide. OK. First thing is under federal law. I think this is an important parameter for people to understand that under federal law, the county may not have the effect of prohibiting the provision of service. So what that means is that we cannot simply say we do not want these services. That is sort of the outer limit. We are allowed to do zoning. The, can we just keep the PowerPoint up for me? Thank you. So the second is that the um, is that the county's transmission facilities coordinating group, or what we sometimes call the tower committee, or the TFCG, enforces the current FCC standards about radio frequency emissions. There are current standards, and for every application that comes through the county, we determine whether they are complying with the current standards. However, the, under federal law, the county may not deny or create zoning regulations on the basis of concerns about the health effects of RF emissions. Under federal law, we can enforce the FCC, the rules the FCC creates, but we cannot create our own rules. And third, the county executive believes that the RF emissions is an issue that is worth investigating. The FCC enacted the current standards in 1996. In 2013, they opened up a new proceeding to see whether those rules needed updating. 
And primarily what they were looking at is because you had a deployment of lots of these things on the roof and you had people that got closer than a meter to them, they wanted to look at those standards. The FCC has not completed that work. They have told us informally that they think that their current standards are still good. And we have said to them, if that's the case, then you should complete the proceeding. The county executive, council member Reamer, representative Raskin, and representatives from all of our congressional delegation met with the chairman of the FCC and told him, the most important thing that you can do to help public acceptance of this new technology is to complete your proceeding and address people's concerns about RF. But for the county, we can enforce those rules, but we cannot zone on the basis of it. Next slide. All right. This slide here is a map of the United States. Those are all the states that have enacted legislation to preempt local authority to address zoning of small antennas. In Ohio, it was overturned because it was part of a pet shop bill. And in California, the governor vetoed it. But what you'll see is that what we believe in Montgomery County is that a local solution is better than state or federal preemption. And we are very concerned that the FCC has opened up three different proceedings to look at ways that they can preempt local government. Congress has enacted a shot clock and said, and this was a piece of legislation that was added to the Middle Class Tax Relief Act saying, there's plenty of room if you want to come on in, saying that where we have modifications that we have to approve those. The FCC has added shot clocks of 60, 90, and 150 days. So in the same way that in the 1990s, we updated our zoning code to address very tall macro towers, what we are trying to do now is to address and come up with rules that protect our neighborhoods and do our best to have that these new antennas are compatible in the neighborhoods at the same time meeting the shot clocks and ensuring that we are not prohibiting the provision of service. Next slide. There's an update. For those of you on the outside, and they're also posted on the county's website, on Friday, uh, Senator Wicker from uh, Mississippi and Senator um, Cortez Masto from Nevada introduced a piece of legislation which would preempt all local zoning for environmental protection review. Now, that's not going so far as to preempt, but this idea that there is not an ability to create enough consensus at the local level and therefore we should preempt is something that we are working to come up with a local solution and we would like to have that Montgomery County model be a model that could be used in other areas throughout Maryland and the region. Um, we plan in, in, in addition the Federal uh, Communications Commission created a broadband deployment advisory committee I will tell you that in that proceeding, when they set it up, initially they had two people from local government. They were asked to create a model ordinance, and there is nobody on the um, committee who actually has experience drafting local ordinances. So we are fighting that as well, and we are hoping that we can come up with something at the Montgomery County level that we can then say and say, this is a good thing to look in other places across the nation. So next slide. All right. So in July, we released a draft zoning. And I will tell you this, that zoning is complicated. It is not that easy to understand. Um, there are lots of implications and lots of moving parts. And for those of you who feel a little bit frustrated about, you know, this is very difficult, I, I understand because zoning is not something that I really knew much about before I started this. Um, so we are trying our best to get through some of the text and then to create other materials that help people understand the gist of what we're working on to provide enough detail, but not so much that you just kind of throw your hands up. All right. What we're suggesting, what we suggested in July is that within the right-of-way, we have, and, and also for parking lot lights, we have street lights, we have utility poles, we have parking lot lights. Those are electrified structures. Those are the kinds of areas that the providers are coming to us and they are asking to be able to deploy equipment. 
So in order to meet those shot clocks, what we are looking to do is to create some bright line rules that you can say, yes, you meet these conditions, in which case those can be a limited use. Um, the limited use means that they go to the tower committee for an engineering review, they go to building permits for safety compliance. They do not have a public hearing. The public hearing would be reserved for conditional use, and those are for cases in which there's some discretion. So it isn't a matter of, yes, I met this condition, it's a matter of, well, does it kind of fit in? And that's what you would use a hearing examiner for at the Office of Zoning and Administrative Appeals. But for the limited use, what we're trying to do is to move through that um, in that process and so that we have a manageable way of doing it. What we looked at doing was to say that the replacement poles could have an extra five to 10 feet depending on the width of the road. We looked at lowering the height that antennas could be placed on so that we would provide alternative locations for co-locations. So you'd have less of a need in some cases to put it in a neighborhood because you could put it on a bank branch, for example. You could put it on a very large grocery store that's only one story. So we're just the same way that in the 90s, what we said is if you co-locate on an existing structure, that's a limited use and you don't need a zoning hearing. But we said if you want to add something new, that would be a conditional use and it would still go through the zoning hearing. Okay, so what we would also do is we would keep the conditional use process. So if you can't replace something that's existing and you can't attach to something that's existing, there is an option for you to continue to go, for a provider to go and get a conditional use hearing. At that point, there would be a public hearing. The Office of Zoning and Administrative Hearings would send notice of the application and you have an opportunity to come in and, and testify. All right, next slide. Okay, so these are the changes and I think I have two or three slides and then we're gonna open it up for questions. Okay, so we set out front is a copy of the October draft of the zoning text. Um, there's nothing that shows you the changes between October and um, July. What we're sort of focused on is this is the current version of where we're at. When you read that document, the brackets designate things that should be deleted from the existing code and the underline shows you things that would be new additions to the code. So there was concern. One of the things that we were concerned about is that if you're in a neighborhood in which the street lights are owned, let me also mention, none of this changes the underlying requirement that you have to have the property owner's permission. So if you want to replace a pole, you want to attach to a pole, you want to attach to a building, the building owner, the pole owner has to provide permission. So there could be cases where in about half the county, um, and it's mostly up county, the utilities are all underground. So there is no aerial telephone poles that you can connect to. And instead, you would um, either have to replace the street light, but if you couldn't get own permission from the owner of the street light, so for example, an association may own that, you might have to go and get a conditional use. And in that conditional use, the way that the, the code currently reads is that it has to be set back 300 feet from the property line. The problem is, if you're using an existing street light and replacing it with something slightly taller, there's almost nothing that's gonna be 300 feet back. So what we wanted was to be able to have a small instance where these shorter poles could be used, but the intention was not to allow taller towers. So what we did is we changed that. We, in July, we had said that we would eliminate the 300 foot setback, and now what we said is we retain that 300 foot setback and you'll see that there's language in there that says instead is that we would go ahead and we would add um, a small exception so that if it is on 35 feet or shorter, the setback is one to one from a dwelling. So it would still have to be for every foot of height of the pole set back from the dwelling at least that many feet. The second thing that we did is under the um, current zoning is when you're using an existing structure. So now I might have replaced something and it's taller and it can hold more antennas or I might have a utility pole and I want to attach antennas to that. For that, these antennas, you could only, you could use that pole, 
the antennas would have to be set back at least 20 feet from an existing dwelling in a residential area and at least 10 feet in a commercial or multi-unit area. And the reason for that difference is, is that where we've built in places like Silver Spring, the, the, um, the buildings are much closer to the street and there really doesn't exist 20 feet between where the poles are and where any of the new buildings are coming. And then what we've also did is previously in the, in the 1990s, we had references to whip antennas and directional antennas and now there's a bunch of different kinds of antennas. Um, and they're going to be new antennas because even though people talk about 5G and small cell, small cell is a meaningless marketing term. It doesn't actually mean anything specific, which is why we sometimes use smaller antennas, micro towers. The problem is if you're searching for, for small cell, we, we try, we're trying to address that. But in those cases, if we can go back for a moment, um, we ended up with all these different sizes. So what we did instead is that in the draft you see now is that we simply replace them with five categories in which there is a maximum size length and there is a maximum volume. And that's what we intend to capture. So whether you use a different kind of technology, the 5G standards, that's, those standards are going to be coming out in March of this year. So there's going to be a lot of change and there's a lot of equipment manufacturers who are looking to design and build things, which is partly why we want to have these standards so that we can have things that um, the industry is trying to meet. All right, next slide. Okay, in the July draft, what we had said is, if you have poles that are shorter than 20 feet, the equipment had to be in the base, and if you had poles that were taller, it could be on top of the equipment or it could be in the base. And after some discussion, the the uh, recommendation was is that we require that all the equipment be in the base or at ground level or it could be stealth. The, um, the issue there is that in order to have equipment at the ground level, it cannot be, it, technologically, it cannot be air cooled because it, one, it doesn't get enough circulation and two, you generally have to do more things to harden the equipment at ground level in case somebody comes along and wants to kick it, and those kinds of things. So a fan is permitted, but it would have to meet the requirements of the noise ordinance, and we would review the noise ordinance to see if there's anything in addition specifically to these types of things that needs to be added. Um, then we also added that graffiti needed to be removed and damage repaired. There was an issue about who was the tower owner and the antenna, but what we're really trying to get at is to make sure is if you put it up, you got to make sure that it continues to look nice. All right, the um, replacement poles and the additional height. An issue that came up is that utility poles that have electrical lines on them, there are minimum distances that you need to have for those lines in order to meet safety standards. And another issue is that you want to avoid some situations where you might have somebody going out, a worker in a bucket truck, and you don't want to necessarily have to have them climbing over, having to get too close to electrified things to get to telecom things. So what we generally said is, if you're looking at a utility pole, you can have an additional 10 feet. Now we look, there are some utility poles that are very large in the county, so we think that 10 should cover it in all situations. In a parking lot where you have those lights, we also said you could have an additional 10, up to 10 feet. For the street lights, in most neighborhoods where you have a paved width of the road that's 30 feet or less, you can have an additional five feet. In some cases where you have at least three or four lanes and the road width, the paved surface is between 30 and 60 feet, for those ones, you could have an additional 10 feet. And there are some places in the county, like Great Seneca Highway, where you'll have a five or six lane road. In those situations, you need more height because one, you need to have the antennas so that any kinds of passing trucks, it's taller than those things. And you also wanna be able to get the antenna to go from both sides of the street. So in those limited cases, there's an additional 20 feet. But those, again, are going to be um, very large things. and They typically have no houses abutting them. Last thing I'll say is that on this piece is that in most cases in the street lights, street lights are almost always roughly two sizes. You've either got the colonial post in a neighborhood, and it's going to be 14 feet tall, 
or you might have a cantilevered cobra head style or taller bronze ones. Most of those ones are roughly about 27 feet. All right, and then if we can look at the slides one more thing. Um, then the last thing on here is there's a lot of discussion about how do we have community input and people's and residences um, and yet still manage to meet the shot clock. So one of the things that we're looking at is that the application system is going to be going online. So what we're hoping to do, one, is to, if you want to register, um, it'll probably be within an HOA area, it would be an automatic trigger. So if something comes in in this geographic area, if you're registered, it would send notice saying something has come in in this area. What we're also doing is having in those applications is having more information that the providers um, give us explaining why did you pick that particular site because in some of these cases sometimes it's engineering sometimes it can be I wanted to move it outside of the ideally I would have put it in the cul-de-sac but I put it on this road because it was on the back side of people's houses and there was an open space across the street but for whatever those things are we think that that's useful information for people to understand and if we can look at the slides I think that that might be can we look at the next one and okay uh, yeah we can go okay so um, we're done with slides. Um, so in the slide deck, I have other slides that we can, we're going to try to figure out if we need them for examples. But with that, we're going to um, go ahead and we're going to turn it over for questions. What I again remind you is that you need to wait for Susan to come with you to the mic. And I like to hope that, you know, as people in Montgomery County, that we will all try to be respectful of each other. Please try not to talk over other people and we'll try to let everybody finish. But I will ask you, to please try to keep your questions short so that we can get to as many as we can tonight. All right. Let's see a hand. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi. Oh, oh, sorry, one more thing. If you would, please say your name because when we go back and we post the video, what we will try to do is to put your name if we can figure out the, the proper spelling so that people can identify who that is speaking. Hi, my name is Kate Keel. <clears throat> um, this is just a legal question and I, I, I presume it's for the gentleman up there. Um, what, two questions. What constitutes service when we are told that we cannot prevent telecom service? What is the definition that's used legally in that document and what doc what law is um, that from? That's question number one. And question number two is in um, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, um, is it preempting um, the construct, uh, objecting to cell towers on the grounds of, uh, to cell towers being erected or is it objecting on the grounds of on health that you or environment? You cannot object to uh, cell towers being erected on the grounds of environmental health, environmental effects, which has been interpreted to mean health. Um, does that include operating the towers, or may we object legally to operating the towers? Uh, on the grounds of health. Okay, so this is Jerry Letterer, our outside counsel. So, if I could repeat. Chief, yes. Hey, Chief, terrific question. Uh, I hear you. For sure. Yeah. Oh, so it's yeah. it's counterintuitive. Red means that it's on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a warning. Watch what you say. Yes. So, Kate. Both terrific questions. You can find the standard uh, for the prohibition or the effective prohibition of service in 47 USC 332 C7. So basically that section talks about five. Uh, it, it says we can't do that, and then it says that there are five areas uh, that we have to follow if we want to preserve our zoning authority and our management authority. Uh, the last one of those has to do with RF. And as you know, Ms. Herrera pointed out in, in the presentation, a great frustration for us at the local government level is that we cannot deny because of RF, the most that we can do is we can demand that there be compliance with the RF standards. In our community, 
This Calte makes a significant investment in having an outside engineering firm, CTC, in fact, check that. And then on, on occasions also go back and check to make sure that they're in compliance on an operating basis. So we think that we're doing the maximum of what we can do today under the law. Now, I, I want to be very, very candid with you. Uh, 332C7 doesn't say anything more than Mitzi said. You asked the better question. What does that really mean? And the answer is yeah, there, are, there are a number of circuit courts around the country, right? So in the federal system, you have a trial court, and then it goes up to a circuit court of appeal. That's where a lot of times the law is made, the interpretation of the statute comes out. Uh, there are conflicting definitions of what that means. Uh, I think everybody agrees, though, that if you say, no, you can't build any, uh, that's going to be found to be a violation of, of, of the prohibiting uh, the provision of service. I'm more than happy, Kate, uh, to, 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 we have a PowerPoint presentation that my firm does. It lists the different uh, circuit courts and what they've said about uh, what is and is not a limitation of the provision of service. And um, I'll get your email afterwards. I'm more than happy to send you that page. I wasn't clear um, as to whether that prohibition um, prohibits the erection of towers on the grounds of environmental uh, effects or whether it prohibits the operation of towers. I, I apologize. I immediately jumped in to read environmental to mean to you RF when it could be a number of other things. I, my, my, my fault. Um, yes, we can impose... We can enforce uh, environmental laws, both NEPA, which is the National Environmental Protection Act, as well as any of our state laws, so long as those state and local laws do not arise to the level of prohibiting the provision of services. So we don't have carte blanche to come up with any rule that we want. I mean, the courts will look at it with a, with a, a bit of a, I don't want to say a cynical eye, but certainly a probing eye to see whether or not the environmental standard we've established is really a way to bar the, the, the construction, the deployment of, of the tower and the services that it would make possible. But Kate, to your specific question, um, and I believe that we have later in the PowerPoint and we can release that. The statute itself says that we may not regulate on the basis of the health effects of radio frequency emissions. So whether we are regulating on the basis of what can be zoned or whether that can be operated, they both likely fall under that same category. Okay, I'm gonna thank you for your question and I'm gonna take one right behind you. Uh, my name is Bob Sonawane. I'm a resident of Montgomery County for the last 30 years. And sure. Susan, will, Susan will hold the. Yeah, Su if you, if you just allow Susan to hold the microphone, that way she'll hold it in a spot okay. that we get the We're best good. audio. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I'm an environmental scientist, retired from EPA, and I made this statement about a year back. I'm still concerned. I know you said about the health effects cannot be debated, basically. I strongly believe, based upon the current scientific evidence, and more accumulating evidence coming up that the low level frequency of radiation can cause DNA damage, cancer for clearly, brain cancer, leukemia in children. I do not think we should neglect the fact we should be fighting with the FCC. The FCC is not, and again I'll repeat, not a health agency. It's not NIH, it's not EPA who makes evaluation of this statement. So I'm, I am tired of hearing this, that we cannot fight this at the congressional level. Again, again, I've been saying this, we need to wake up and protect this, the, the children as well as protect the citizens of the Montgomery County. Thank you. Okay. If I could ask um, no, no, on no, the I'm slide, on, I, I think second, if I could ask on the slide deck if we could go to slide 18, and then I want to have Andrew Afterback right. answer that question or address that comment. So um, to the point of, of, of the FCC and not being a health agency, I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I can't really speak to that in particular what, it, I mean, other than that obviously it, it has its own mandate for what it is. Um, it, we did an analysis that was requested by the county to look at comparing the RF emission from um, both the proposed 
um, small cell locations that, that we have actually received <laughs> applications for, and then one that was sort of cranked up to what we would imagine would be a worst case scenario, which would be taking that cell site and then putting up three more uh, antennas on three different bands at the same location, and then multiplying the power by another factor of 10 for each one of those by putting up a, um, a very directional antenna and then pointing it at a house. And the idea is to, to try to look at... Can, can we get the slide deck up? Yes, thank you. The idea is to answer um, a question. It, it couldn't, we couldn't really address the question, what is in this, what is the long-term effect? What is, where, where all these other diseases and so forth? That's not kind of where we can um, act. But what we did is compare it as something that people work with and understand. So for example, microwave oven, uh, a cell phone. And so the example was, if you had a cell phone that was three inches away from you, how far away would you have to place one of these small cell sites to get the equivalent amount. Um, the answer was uh, for the first case, the one where, where we did get an application um, and, and that was approved, is 2.3 feet. So in other words, for the same energy that you would have for holding your phone like this, um, it would have to be at 2.3 feet to get the same level from uh, the small cell site. Going back to the other example I mentioned, which is, okay, suppose you had three different companies putting antennas on, and then you multiplied by 10 the power of those by, by putting on a directional antenna, and then pointing it directly into a particular direction, someone's house perhaps. So the answer for that is um, nine feet, essentially, to get that equivalence. Or, so even in that case, if you pointed all of that in one direction, all that radiation, uh, is essentially um, 10 feet away again to, to reach the equivalence of a, of a cell phone that you're using. So um, we also compared, like I said, to the microwave oven. Um, so instead of nine feet, it's 10.5 it's feet would be the equivalence uh, with a cell phone, or I'm sorry, with a microwave oven uh, of, of this, uh, again, the very uh, high power site. So that's, it was, the idea was to sort of see where are we with some of the distances that we're looking at some of the proposed ZTA rules in terms of safety? And so, um, again, compared to, to what we're looking at here, that's the distances we're looking at. In addition to what um, uh, Ms. Sarah is talking about, uh, there's also, as she mentions, a review that goes with every single one of these applications for compliance with the FCC rules. So that's with the current FCC rules. And then, as, as you're saying, um, Mitzi, that, that hopefully there's a review that's going to continue uh, in the FCC, and then it would be with whatever subsequent FCC rules um, exist with regard to this. Yeah. <clears throat> for, for, for a number of folks that are here for the first time, I'd just like to take a half second. Mitzi mentioned it in her presentation. You've heard us talk about this in the past, uh, but for folks for, that are here for the first time, um, you need to know that the county executive Congressman Raskin, Councilman Reamer, and a representative of every single one of our Senate and House offices spent a day at the commission with pretty much the, I won't say the single, but certainly the primary message to be that the RF standards need to be updated. And so I can understand every bit of frustration that might be expressed on RF tonight I, I just simply need to tell you that the elected leadership of the county is doing everything it can to try to have those updated. And, 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 I, I, and I can give you the, the site where you can pull up where we, at the FCC if you meet, you have to file something called an ex parte letter which documents for everyone that you've been there, who was there, who you met with, and what you talked about. And I'm more than happy to get you a copy of that ex parte letter, which outlines in detail that it was the leading issue that the county executive raised over and over and over again with all five commissioners. The and, chairman, okay. Yeah, and I would add that if you go to the, an, the antenna um, ZTA site, there is a section on there about radio frequency emissions. A summary of all those meetings, there is a memo from the county executive to the community that is on there and the various letters that were sent in and that have been filed are also there. So let me, before I come back down in front, are there other RF questions? Okay, so let's sort of take them in the back in the blue sweater. Yes, yes ma'am. Wait for the mic.
I'm Stephanie Link, and um, I have a friend, Lisa, who um, she has the electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And the, when you were talking about the cell phones and the microwave, um, she doesn't have a cell phone or a microwave in her home, and she can choose to do that. But she won't be able to choose if there's a cell phone, you know, close to her house, she can't keep it out of her house. So I guess I would say, how are you going to help those people? Are, um, is there a possibility of having some um, RF free safe zones <laughs> in the um, county or something so, like that? So there, so a, a couple things. First is, is that one thing to also remember is that within your phone, for those of you who remember the shoebox size phone or the flip phone where you had to pull out the little antenna, your phone itself has an antenna. And actually, the better your signal is, the less, the, the less your phone has to work. And so the RF within your phone is actually less. There isn't a realistic possibility of creating RF free zones because A, there's a lot of stuff out there, and B, there are going to be other people who want to have their cell phone work. I think the county can look at it on a case by case basis because there's other things. There can be people that are delivering packages that come to your house and they have a cell phone signal and they have an electronic thing that you've got to sign that's going back. So there's other things besides these. I'm sure that county in lots of different ways, there can be things where we have these kinds of unique um, health things to try to figure out what can be done. But in general, it's not feasible to say that we'll just have areas of the county where cell phones don't work. Next question, um, Donna Barron. Just, uh, just on the, these are just the RF. I'm gonna try and take a couple more of these and then. It's, <laughs> Uh, Donna Barron, um, I was interested in the way you uh, said the way you checked it, and that would be from the tower into a house. So you're saying for the people in the house, it would what it would be for them, right? So on our neighborhood, in our neighborhood, there are a lot of people who walk. We have to walk in the streets because the developer was not required to put in sidewalks. That's another issue. So no, we don't have time for tonight. Nope, not <laughs> sidewalks tonight. So, but at any rate, so we last on Saturday, I drove about a mile in our neighborhood, and there were at least 15 people with their dogs and kids walking along the street. So the problem is, and the question that I have is, are we collecting all of this RF? Because as most people here know, our neighborhood is scheduled to get 13 cell towers. Everybody else gets two, but we're special. We get 13. So as we walk around through our neighborhood, are we collecting that RF radiation from all those 13 towers? So I, I think that's, that's a really good question because we, we were mostly thinking about the case of, well, you're pointing at a house and we want to be concerned about someone who's in their room or whatever there. But um, so it's the same thing in all directions potentially. And so that's why the height uh, rules that are in fact here are, are also considering people who are walking by or people who are right near it, um, nearby. So um, again, if the we're, we're talking about a three um, a three foot or, or two point three foot rather uh, relative to um, a cell phone, and so if the radio itself is fifteen feet, and the drop off of the radiation goes roughly with um, depending on where the antenna is pointing, either with the distance or the distance squared, um, you have significantly less um, radiation when you're right at the foot of it than when you're um, like basically three feet away from it, which is you'd have to climb the pole basically to get to get up there. And one thing that we're actually required to to have the, the cell phone <coughs> carriers um, put in their application is that they have to put signage on the pole itself, warning of the RF, so that if anybody were to 
have to go up there, for example, if you're a, a utility worker um, and you're, you have to do business, you have to be up there um, and you're in proximity there, there are the warning signs and then you can have the, uh, you have to, you know, the radio shut off in order that you can safely do work up there. But, you're, but it's a good point and, and I just brought that as an example of the house, but it also governs uh, people who are walking by who are, who are outside. Same whether you're like five feet from it versus across the street? No. Absolutely no, no. So not. So, okay, it's, so, Mitzi, so, can, if I can just answer it's, yeah. it's this, it drops off with the square of the distance. So if you are, you get a certain level of radiation when you're four feet away. If you're eight feet away, you get one quarter of that and so on and so forth. I'm talking about walking right next to these poles. Right. In so which case you are. Up, in if we could pull up that slide for a moment, I think in the distance that we're talking about, on the shortest poles that we we're talking about here, the pole itself is 14 feet, and the idea is that you would add five feet, and the antenna is going to be probably at about 17 feet. What this is showing you is where you have one antenna, when you get at least 2.3 feet away, and that's in any direction, whether it's directly underneath, whether it's at a 90 degree angle off to the side. Once you get past that distance, you can see that the amount of frequency dissipates and it is less than you will have than carrying the phone with you on the walk. If you were to put three antennas up there, the distance would have to be 10 and a half feet. Now, we made it so that the suggestion was in the neighborhoods where you had, particularly where you only had these 14 foot poles, in order to fit into the neighborhood, we did not want to have more than an additional five feet. It is entirely possible, if you wanted, that we could have these things up higher. And I will say that after the meeting tomorrow, all of these slides will be available to folks. Okay, next, next question. One, we have one more. How about in the gentleman in the back with the beard? Yes, I think <coughs> the... Uh, oh, wait, could you say your name? Oh, sorry, my name is Kier Soderberg. I'm a resident in Germantown. Um, I think the description of the, um, the delegation that went uh, to, to represent us uh, to ask for more information about the safety rep is a good indication of the uncertainties involved. Um, if, it's as safe, if it's as safe as a cell phone, why are they all going out there to, to, to make this, um, this call for more information? Um, and in the light of the other things that have been said, I noticed um, one of the proposed cell phone towers is um, in my neighborhood, right uh, where I, my kids wait to be picked up at the, um, at the library. What are, what are our safeguards, I guess, and what can we, what can we do to, to ask for a higher tower in that kind of a, a, a sensitive situation, so given the uncertainties involved? So, okay, so a couple of things on asking for a higher tower. One, that's one of the things that we're trying to work out, is it feasible with the TFCG to say, so in this situation, you bring, like I know, now I find out that there's an application, is it feasible to say, is it possible to make that taller? What we're trying to avoid is it can't simply be, is it possible not to put it in front of my house and to put it in my neighbor's house, or is it possible to put it in front of, you know, the guy I don't like in the neighborhood who never comes to the potlucks? So, so we're, we're, we're trying to balance that out. But um, it, it can be something that we can try to handle on an individual basis. One thing that I would note is some of the things that when you have a lot, a lot of people have mentioned this about kids and elementary schools and waiting. There are a lot of parents who look at their devices and kids who look at their devices while they're waiting for the bus. My department handles the Wi-Fi in Montgomery County Public Schools um, with Montgomery County Public Schools and the consumption that teenagers, when they have an unlimited access to Wi-Fi, is enormous. So part of the challenge is that, the, that younger people, parents, kids, are actually some of the folks that are driving the need in some cases 
why a provider may come in and say, I need to get more capacity in that area because I get a lot of users. But I think that on that kind of case, I mean, it might be something what we'd like to be able to look and see on a, on a height. Is there an engineering? Is there a reason for it? One thing about the code, though, if we come in with the code and we say the maximum you get is five feet in that type of situation, um, it limits some of the flexibility unless we move it to a different type of hearing. But see me, I'll give you my card afterwards, so talk to me about that specific one. Okay, let me come down in front for uh, one more RF question, and then I'm going to try to, um, I'll take one more over here, and then we'll move on. Mario Pascal. Uh, I wanted to come back to your study. Um, have you, in fact, studied the cumulative effect of uh, um, RF? Um, uh, we now understand that the distance at the shortest, you know, possible distance to a residential home will be 14 feet. Worst case scenario, you know, it, it will be um, the equivalence of a cell phone at uh, like 10 feet, and uh, that will be kind of right across from somebody's uh, bedroom on the second or third floor. Uh, but people don't hold a cell phone for 24 hours, 365 <laughs> day uh, of the year, next to their year, or even, you know, uh, in, at a distance. So the question is, uh, you know, w have you ever looked into the cumulative effect? Hmm. No, that wasn't what we were asked to do. And, and you're right, that's an open question. And again, that's why I think you want to have real study conducted, as, as what um, Ms. Herrera said. Okay, but let's, but let's be clear about this. There, what we look, there are, so, and Andrew, you can weigh in on this. Right now, there are not federal studies that look to determine if I stand for one minute at something that's 10 times the power versus I stand for 10 minutes with something that's one times the power. There, there are no studies or things like that out there right now. Is that correct? I, I think I, I haven't studied whether there are studies on that, but and, and I'm sure there's been a lot of research done on it, but it hasn't been something that's been definitively but there, adopted. But there are no federal, there are no federal standards on that specific point. There, right, that's correct. Okay, so let's, okay, so I, I gather we're going we're gonna to cover some more RF questions. Um, let me go over to here in the corner. Hi, uh, Carrie Cunningham. Uh, just um, quickly, if Carrie, I, why don't you I'm, let Susan hold the mic, and oh, she'll sure. hold it spot where If I understand this, if I understand this correctly, you can have these towers within 20 feet of a bedroom that has a child in it sleeping. This includes yes. This yes. includes newborns toddlers yes and all the time they sleep they're going to be there now well let's let's well, well it, it I, is the antenna will be there but yes. the antenna is not necessarily on all the time okay i, I just i just uh, it's a little bit of a hypothetical to put it out there i don't expect you to answer it but when the class action lawsuits coming start coming in for the birth defects or the learning disabilities or the cognitive problems because children are going to be sleeping near these towers where we don't have studies that really show whether it's safe or not. How is that risk going to be managed? That's all. All right, so in these cases, the, the owner and the operator of the antenna is the one that has the liability for those, and um, this isn't a—I mean, as a legal opinion—but the, the the federal statute right now says that we may not make regulations on the basis of our concerns about the health effects of RF. Just, 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 okay, just, just, so just hold, okay. So hold, hold on. Let's let's try to. I will try to call on people, but let's let's try to let each person have their turn. Okay. So. Under the Equal Protection Clause, I don't think it's going to be the case where you can say that this Telecommunications Act, which allows them to just roll right through on eminent domain, supersedes child's health and safety. That may have to be settled in the courts. Okay. Could you please correct her? Okay, so let me go over to the corner. Please. Please. Thanks. 
Or she disappeared. Okay, there was a question. Oh. This, did you want to, did you have a question? Okay, wait, wait, wait for the microphone. Can't hear and, you. And say, and say your name when it comes. Thank you. My name is Nancy Wallace. I'm co-chair of the Montgomery County Green Party. I was a candidate last year. I've been on the board of directors of a, an NGO, a women's group, working on this issue for four years. First of all, I'd like to clarify that Section 704 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act does not preempt on the basis of health and safety. It mentions the word environment, that's all, and the implied conflict preemption of one court system has, in fact, brought that in so that it it sweeps it in in case of a possibility that um, environment includes health and safety. Other, uh, other courts, excuse me. No, I'm going to read the law. I'm going to read yeah. the law since you accused us of not okay, telling the truth. Let's, let's, I'm going to read the law and everyone else can determine. Okay, wait, let's, <coughs> let's, let's, let's. All right. Let, let's let Nancy go ahead and finish. No, and I've, read we'll six, go ahead. I've read section 704. Um, and uh, another court system in the U.S., another um, uh, circuit, has in fact not gone along with the implied conflict preemption. Uh, so what I would like to, to say tonight to the people here and to um, the county executive uh, office is I, we would request, uh, we being myself and others in the Green Party that are concerned about this, it violates the Green Party's platform on precautionary principle, which means you don't roll out technologies until there have been adequate studies. <laughs> and, our, um, and there are about 10,000 scientific and medical studies now showing the harm of this type of radiation. It's very clear, it's at bioinitiative.org, uh, among other, um, other uh, websites. And every other Western country and Israel are reducing their uh, wireless. They're taking it out of schools. In Israel, it is now illegal to expose any child from zero to six years of age to any wireless in any school system. And from six years to 12 years of age, a maximum of one hour per day. This is a killer radiation, and 5G, the ultra high frequency, is the basis for the Department of Defense active denial system, which is a ray gun. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube, active denial system, and that's what this is designed for in terms of the 5G infrastructure. So what we would like to request is that the county file a suit against the Federal Communications Commission requiring them to carry out their, their statutory authority to regulate this since they have refused for the last 20 years to look at any new medical studies. They've refused the American Academy of Pediatrics request four years ago to open the regulations and reevaluate and that we do not implement any additional or any small cell technology in Montgomery County until that lawsuit has reached its conclusion. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want to ask in the booth if we could put up slide 23, which has the federal restrictions on managing antennas, because there it has the language. I want to let people know, and if you do go to the website, um, in January, the county executive, when he sent a letter to the um, commission um, asking them to address the RF issues as an appendix, all of the various studies that people had sent in to us, whether they were on rats, they were in foreign studies, there were other ones, all those studies we included as an attachment. And we noted to the FCC that this is the problem of not exercising leadership on this issue because there is other information out there and that's why people are asking. So this section here, um, is um, is what it is, is and I did say health effects and it is environmental effects of that. Jerry, did you have anything else that you wanted? <coughs> yeah, I'd like to read the actual statute because I think we were told that it didn't say it. And we're what and if you want to take a note, this is forty seven USC three thirty two C seven B little four and it says no state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, 
and modification of a personal wireless service facility on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the Commission's regulations concerning such emissions. So I, I, need, to I need to apologize to, the, uh, to, to uh, Carrie, I guess it is, right, for, for, for Nancy, for my, my reaction. I just, the, uh, we're, we're, we're not telling stories here. I mean, this is a limitation, and the gentleman's question is something that you're right, that perhaps the courts will resolve someday as to what's, you know, the primacy of the different rules. But it's clear cut that if we're preempted, courts have, <laughs> have made it very clear that, that that that's what the you know the federal law would be primary. Now all these other ideas are things that I you know that the county is pursuing. We're just trying to be as honest as possible as to what our limitations are. And again, I mean we represent lots of local governments around the country. Not everybody has an engineering firm on staff that can help us try to make decisions about well lots of folks don't want the towers being very tall. But if we can show that by making it taller, we reduce the exposure level, the chronic exposure level that some folks are worried about. I mean, it's things that we're trying to, we're trying to work within the parameters and we continue to try to push the parameters to have the commission do the job that it should do. Okay, we, we are at about um, almost at our halfway point. So let me take just a couple more questions and then I'd like to move on to other issues. If we run out of those questions, we can come back to this issue. Okay, so in the back of the room here, in the brown sweater standing up. Thank you very much. My name is Marcy Pollan. Um, I've testified at the FCC, and I can talk about that later. I think it's a non-starter to invoke the FCC in this in this discussion, quite frankly, having had personal experience there and having five people from the commission approach me, having not the slightest idea of the impact, not only of 5G, but of 4G or any of this technology, okay? Let me try to paint you a, a brief picture. If you look at blood cells, they should be round and individuated and flowing, floating freely in the plasma, right? They have a charge. Cell phones have a charge. That's why cell phones are called cell phones, I think, because they work very similarly they carry an electronic, electromagnetic charge. If that charge is disrupted, that's the foundation of ill health, okay? So 10,000 studies have been done on this issue. They've been done for decades, suppressed by industry, which now controls the state of California, and that legislation has been passed now that prevents any kind of s s lawsuit happening in the state of California. That's gonna happen here because we're having a very civil and very mannerly discussion about a lethal technology that's designed to have that level of impact in our lives. When you start putting these things, when, when, these, when these units are put up in the county or anywhere in this country, this shatters DNA. 5G technology will shatter DNA, and there's no curtain, there's no wall that's gonna prevent that from happening. There are no subsidiary protections or issues that, that we can discuss that's going to solve the problem on that level. This is just the reality of the situation, and it's provable under the microscope. If you look at blood under a microscope within 15 minutes, not even holding a cell phone, for people who have you know, a lot of exposure to cell phone technology, even just Wi-Fi in the house, if you look 15 minutes after exposures, the blood cells begin to coagulate. They begin to stick together, and when they're stuck together, they cannot transmit oxygen or nutrients to the tissues. And when the tissues are not being nourished, then the organs become ill. And then that leads to a diagnosis of you know, symptoms and a diagnosis and treatment. With, well, that's a whole other discussion. But this is, a, this is there, there are no, there are no, there's no middle ground in any of this, okay, quite frankly. And I think many of us are aware of that here. Thank you. Okay, um, in the interest of time, since we're reaching the halfway point, what I'd like to focus on, are there questions other than RF um, and try to go around and do, do a few of those? Yes, sir, <laughs> why don't we come on up front? Susan's getting her steps in today. But again, I will remind you, we have about an hour left, so I would ask you to please try to keep your questions short so that we can get in as many as we can. My name is Aaron Rosenswag. I want to clarify the point about our hands being tied, where we say that the federal law is clear that Montgomery County cannot pass zoning laws that would have the effect of prohibiting service throughout the county. It's a half-truth, perhaps 50% true. 
It means we cannot outright ban wireless towers, but as long as we treat every cell phone company the same and have a clear set of zoning regulations, we can still deny towers. The most simple example is that we should require poles that will break away when a car hits them. Almost all light poles are built this way because it saves the life of the driver who hits one. These new small cell towers have 300 pound antennas on the top and are twice as tall as our light poles. These poles must be hardened so that they don't fall when hit by a car. Basically, they are designed to kill the driver. If our regulations require breakaway poles, we aren't outright banning 5G. We just aren't willing to give up common sense safety for technology that is not ready. <laughs> to say it another way, as long as smart regulations are in place, we can deny cell towers within their shot clock period based on hard reasons. Strict residential neighborhood siting criteria. In the unlikely event, the cell tower company unequivocally demonstrates that there is no alternative to a residential neighborhood site, meaning no feasible alternative location and a demonstrated need, then we must have a very strict siting and design criteria. In short, if the installation is out of place in the neighborhood or can be recognized as a cell tower, then it is unacceptable. Full, stop, end of story, no exceptions. A cell tower next to a home will significantly lower its value as fewer people will be willing to buy the home. We must protect our neighborhoods. It is unac unacceptable that our community's families take a huge financial hit just so that a predatory company can increase their revenue. Okay. Well, a significant gap does not mean everyone has lightning fast 4G LTE downloads, but there is reasonable access to wireless service from the provider. In cases where courts have found a significant gap exists, thousands of people have poor or non-existent service. This means they can't make calls or establish a data connection. Not that they can't stream high definition video. The law doesn't entitle the wireless industry to obtain competitive foothold to compete with wired services, because that's what this is. They are trying to place this in our neighborhoods, position infrastructure, and gain a competitive advantage as a speculative business opportunity not to close a significant gap. That is why they are here in Montgomery County, here in Palo Alto, California, and New York. We are candy to the wireless industry. Aaron, I'm going to have to. We need to become hard candy, I'm going to have to cut you off at one page. One page. Do we have, do we, is so there a explain question? To me, okay, explain I'll try to, me address, why we I'll can't try to do address the your points. Away. Let me address your points. Okay, that's fair. All right, so a couple things on the first, let's talk about the breakaway polls. Well, and first, let me sort of preface this uh, by also saying the zoning code is uh, parameters of what you are allowed to do. It is not a an, an authorization authorization that you can do it. So for example, if you have a house um, and the zoning code says you could replace it and add a two-story house, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, the person who owns it, I just get to go in and take your house and replace it because the zoning code says I, I, I can do that. So in the same way, the street lights are owned by Mo that are owned by Montgomery County. About 17,000 of them we own, about 20,000 we place on a utility pole owned by somebody else. But where we own the street lights, we actually have, in addition to the zoning code, more authority to address it. And I actually have Dan Sanaya is in the back with the Department of Transportation and working on the breakaway issue in particular. And the specific language for that is most likely to happen in a separate agreement that a provider may have if you want to use any of our property, these would be specific requirements. In addition, one of the things that we looked at about moving the equipment and saying that you would have the antenna, the equipment, there's something called a radio head. And what that does is it converts this wireless RF signal into an IP data packet, an internet protocol data packet, and it goes through a piece of fiber in most cases. The, um, that equipment is what tends to weigh more. And so part of moving and saying that that equipment needs to be at the base or at the ground level is moving it away from the issue of somebody coming into the pole and knocking down the pole. So on the breakaway issue, that is something that we are trying to figure out and it's likely gonna go into the licensing agreement that the county has. In addition on the standards, things that we own, we have more ability to address that. 
what we are likely to do is what we need to do is to, it's like when you go and you get business cards printed. There's a certain setup charge and then after that they all become cheaper. It's the same thing with designing and making these polls. So the feasibility that you can come in, well, this one I want like this and this one I want like this makes it very difficult. But for Montgomery County at the beginning to come in and say, all right, if you, just the same way, if you go on our website now and you want to see a street light, you'll find the specs for the six, six different kinds of street lights we have. And you'll find the specs for the six different kinds of luminaires that we have on there. We are looking to come up with a design. In addition, when we met with um, the Silver Spring Urban Advisory District, part of what they were also concerned was in that area is that they've been trying to add things where they can have banners um, that may sit and there's room for that. Um, there may be other kinds of applications that they're interested in. So we are trying to accommodate and take all of those in. But those will come in the licensing agreement for our specific polls, not in the zoning ordinance. All right, can, I, can we have another question? Maybe we'll go right, the woman in the denim with the glasses. It's not quite denim, but it's denim colored. Hi, my name's Annette Nelson. Um, my question is, it seems like a majority of people here are against this, so what exactly can we do to stop it from happening in our residential neighborhoods? Well, so a couple, so a couple things to think about. We have a very large workforce that telecommutes. Probably one of every, of, of the federal workforce, of the active federal workforce that works in the DC area, probably 30% of them live in Montgomery County. And they may telework one day, uh, a week. We have 25,000 businesses in Montgomery County that are one and two person consulting entities. And when I worked in the cable office, we had lots of calls from people who have home-based businesses for whom they felt that I cannot be without internet. Um, Aaron mentioned it. You will have, and, the, and we say that this this technology is it's it's new, and it um, so in most cases, if you have a wireline provider, a Comcast, Verizon, FiOS, or RCN, and then you may have a a wireless router in your house. When you buy that package from them, it may be that they almost want to throw in the television service, the video service, for free. So maybe $70 to have internet and it's $80 if you want to have cable. For a long time in the industry, what people wanted to have was a triple play. So they offer you a telephone, an internet, and a video. So you look at a provider, not to call them out, but you look at somebody like AT&T. AT&T has a wireless cellular telephone service. They have bought direct TV. They are now doing advertisements saying, if you sign up for us with our phone plan, you get direct TV, we'll give you a deal. AT&T may want to try to use this so that they could say, I can offer you a wireless, cellular-based 5G, 4G service that is as got as much capacity as that wireline service that you have coming to your house now. Now, that might mean for some consumers that there's new price competition. I will tend to say that in all the cases I've seen these in the past, what tends to happen is things are not offered at a lower price. They tend to be that you get more, I'll offer you more at the same price. So in some of these cases, the problem is, is that even when we had the cell phones in the 1990s and lots of folks didn't wanna have these, we're using more and more mobile data. What's, there are some providers, it's a mixed bag. Some people are, it's a business plan speculation. For other people, they look at their current capacity and they see that they have problems. Okay, so the problem, so the issue of, if you don't, if you don't, the, the, it's a hard question. Because, the, because what we're trying to balance is that we want Montgomery County to be the, uh, at the cutting edge of technology. We want our residents in attracting a new millennial base to come and we want to have that service. So in some cases, 
we are looking for ways to balance a way to have this in rather than to say no. People who have showed up here seem to be, for the most part, against this. So what can we do okay, to let, I'm gonna ask. I'm going to ask that. I, I want to hear what your question is. So okay. I'm going to try to ask people to please not interrupt and let people speak. So most of us, it seems like, judging from the applause, that most of us here are against this, that we've showed up to say that we're not for this technology and we're residents of the county. So what can we do to try to prevent that from happening? Like what can happen with the zoning? Because if we can't think about it in terms of a health impact, then how can we approach that as a problem to fight against it? So well, what we're trying to do is to find ways to make these things that they're compatible within neighborhoods. The county executive will send over a zoning ordinance and certainly it will be up to the county council to approve it like all legislation there will be a public hearing in which people can voice um, their opposition or things that they would like to it but i can tell you that to be candid what we are trying to do is to find a way that we can avoid the more federal preemption we can avoid more federal or state imposed that let's take away local zoning and just say that you have to have whatever somebody comes in and wants to have. And so what we are trying to do is to work on find ways of how to make it compatible. Is there a way, one last thing, sorry. Is there a way to make it so that we just have it in business areas instead of residential areas? Because it seems like that's a bigger issue for people, it's having it in our neighborhoods. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to, to Jerry, but sure. but I do wanna say is that, um, and, and I appreciate where, where you're coming from. One of the things is we really are trying to make more commercial properties available. And I will tell you, there's some providers who are focused, even Verizon. Verizon has some things that they want to deploy in downtown Silver Spring, and they have some things that they want to employ in residential areas. So there isn't, it isn't that we just have use in the commercial areas. I'm gonna turn it to Jerry. Sure, <clears throat> I think the most important thing that we all um, need to acknowledge is that the four of us have no votes. What we have been charged with is trying to come up with the, the most protective policy that the council can consider as a means to move forward and be consistent. The other thing that the council has seen is that around the country, uh, 13 states have passed laws uh, that would take away local government authority with respect to the deployment of small cells in the rights of way. There was one exception in the state of Arizona, the city of Yuma was able to get an exemption because they were grandfathered in. And so that's a little bit also of what's happening here is, is our hope to come up with a, with a program and a policy. And again, I mean, so that we get points like from Aaron um, you know, that it's not that we don't want to take, talk about RF, but if there are things that non RF issues that we can change in the policy that would make it more acceptable. Those are the types of, of, of comments that we're looking for. And at some point, you know, we're going to have to share this with the county executive and share with him uh, the issues that have been uh, that, that have arisen. I assume that everyone in this room will be sharing with their county council members their feelings on this and it'll be democracy in action. We're just doing the best that we can, but we have no votes. We have no votes, but the other side is that there are efforts, there are efforts, oh, sure you do, absolutely you do. <laughs> the, the, there are efforts underway where, where folks that aren't in Montgomery County, whether they be in Annapolis or they be uh, at the FCC are looking to bypass our ability to do anything. Okay, I'm gonna take the woman in the green shirt in the middle on this side. Oh, sorry, green jacket. Someone's having fun out there. Oh, thank you. I'm Meredith Wellington, and I served eight years on the Montgomery County Planning Board that determines all the zoning. And my question is, why can't you make this use conditional in all parts of the county? Okay, so the conditional use would, um, part of the issue is that it's one is it's a the, the the conditional use would 
require that there is a zoning hearing for every one of these. And so, all right, so part, of, so part of it, part of it is, is a concern, is that it would be very difficult. We have a hard time right now, we have streamlined that process so that when you have a new antenna to make the 150 day shot clock. In the past two years since we updated the zoning code, we've had two applications come in that manner. It would be very difficult for us to be able to manage that process where we would have a hundred of these potentially pending and have a zoning hearing for each of them. In addition, what the zoning hearing is designed to do is to determine if something is compatible with the community. So by setting up certain parameters and saying, if it's only five or 10 feet taller than something that is existing, if it's placed within two feet of something that's already there, if it's attached to a building, the assumption is, is that it is compatible with community use. And that allows us to process those applications more quickly and that reserves more time for the ones that are more difficult for us to do. Uh, well, excuse me, Mer just a, Meredith, can I say one other thing? Is I think a lot of people are making the mistake that if it goes through a conditional use that it will be turned down. And that, that isn't necessarily correct. No, no. Um, also, also what we're afraid of, and last comment on this, is that if, if, it, if the shot clock runs, then it's, it is allowed by right. And that's, that's, that's a problem. So therefore, we're trying to thread this needle by trying to just find a way that we can make these more compatible with the neighborhoods and not a proliferation. And that, I think that's what we're trying to do. And because the conditional use could allow um, these, these towers to go in just by right because you don't have the resources to hold the hearings, right? But the reason they could go by right is you would miss the time deadline and, and you wouldn't be able to hold the hearing in time. Is well, well cer certain, so again, certain things, for, for antennas in which there's an antenna that's there now and you wanna swap it out, Congress mandated that we may not deny those. And the FCC took that to say, well, swapping something out and they made it much larger because they were really thinking of much taller antennas. The thing that actually concerns me is if you look at the federal government and the various budget and the things, these are the kinds of situations where you tend to have these must pass bills and things get attached. And that piece of, of uh, we must approve all of these, these antenna modifications was attached to the middle class tax relief act that had to get passed. So part of this is, um, and that's why I put out there is this other legislation, is that one of the things that we really are trying to address is if it takes 150 days for all of these things, it creates more friction for at the FCC and the BDAC. This is an agency, again, that has not completed this proceeding in four years that is actively looking to say is 90 days too long and that should be shortened to 30. And the county executive made this point with the chairman of the FCC that by shortening those shot clocks, you are precluding the possibility of having public hearings because you cannot get enough notice, hold the hearing and do the report within those periods of time. So part of what we're trying to do are to find the situations where we can find some bright line standards, say that these would be compatible, and to leave the other ones that may be more difficult for, for a different one. Let me go and move to the gentleman in the green shirt. I just want to say one more thing, which is I realize we can't write this legislation here tonight, and it is complicated. And I'm sure the county is working as hard as it can to protect citizens. But the zoning tool to address this is to look at having more situations, more areas of the county where it's a conditional use. And you might want to just do that in the neighborhoods, in the residential neighborhoods, make it a conditional use. It, it, it already exists. It already exists as a conditional use. So, I mean, the, the, it's not a matter that we need to make m more. If you, if you don't fit 
in the parameters that we lay out currently right now, which is attaching to a building, attaching to an existing structure, your remedy is to go and get a conditional use. So that exists now. The issue is, are there more things that we would move in place as limited use? The gentleman in the green shirt. My name is Al Hamidzadeh. Thank you for holding this hearing. I'm an Army veteran, a doctor, and an ex-engineer. Um, my question is, why, if there is problem with service, and I understand I used to work at the Pentagon, people like to uh, telework, why not use voice over IP? Because for most providers, once you get near your router, your, your, your actually your cell phone, should be able to switch over to voice over IP. And then uh, that's one thought. And my second question is really repeating what all my uh, basically uh, 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 neighbors here essentially are, are uh, asking. Uh, we appreciate the fact that this is a difficult task to deal with. I do realize that the FCC's chairman is an ex Verizon legal counsel. So, um, however, what we are asking is, we feel passionate about this. How would you or the chairman of FCC feel if they, somebody were to held a cell phone to their, basically next to, ne next to their children's head 24 seven? We feel that kind of passion. I feel that about my children, about my neighbor's children, about all these people here. So how can we fight them? Thanks. Okay, so uh, a couple things, um, a couple things on that. One, it, I, I, would, I will say candidly, we need to find more Republican allies on Capitol Hill, and we need to find more industry allies to talk with the FCC. So, uh, somebody made the point that the FCC is not a health agency, and they themselves will say that. And they will say that's why it's very hard for us, because we have to talk to these other agencies, of which I would say, well, they're all in Montgomery County. I mean, certainly you can do it. But, you're, but the issue is, is that the, the FCC is the entity that's charged with doing it. And to get them to move, I think that we need to find um, more persuasive in industry. Now, I will say that from the industry that the, um, the, the, the president of the Wireless Industry Association agrees that the FCC, these are the people who, who build, the, build the towers. They're not the carriers providing the service, but they're the tower builders. It's their trade association. They, he agrees that the FCC needs to complete this proceeding. And he's willing to go with us to meet with the FCC. We are working with our legislative office to see, can we find other Republican members? And most of you know there's only one Republican member in Maryland, but there are some other ones, particularly in Virginia. So we're looking to try to find, can we find some other voices that say to the commission that you need to address this? On the, um, uh, the first part of your question, I can't quite recall. Voice over IP. Okay, so this is just one quick issue about this. The, the federal statutes since at least 96 and a little bit before then have basically taken the, the position that what we need to do is eliminate regulation, eliminate consumer protections, and expand competition. Because that way, if people don't like it in one thing, they can just go to something else. I'm not suggesting that I think that works. I'm just saying is that that is the basis for decision after decision that overturned or that limited what local governments can do. So in that case, it was entirely the case when people said, well, I have Comcast in my house. Why do I need to have Verizon come and dig up my yard so that you can offer me something else, which is the same thing that Comcast is providing. Why do I need a cell phone? I have a landline telephone, and it works great in my house. There's lots of examples. Why do we need to have satellite dishes that sit on people's houses? Because you're perfectly capable of either getting over-the-air broadcast or cable television. So we just have a long history 
and that the law is set up, that it is designed, that it's looking for competition under the premise that it will benefit consumers because you'll either get lower prices or you'll get more robust service offerings. All right, um, let me go to the gentleman in the back with the white golf cap hat. I'll, I'll come back over on that side. Getting my work out tonight, yes. First of all, I'd, I'd like to thank, oh, my name is Mark Malamud. I live in North Potomac in the Wesley neighborhood. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, your patience and uh, your, con your continued struggle in our behalf. I recognize now I've not always been uh, that understandable and understanding in my questioning in the past, and I apologize for, for any impatience I've shown. Um, I do want to ask two questions. Because uh, we've seen a lot of slides in the past few meetings. Are we going to see a, a slide that will show us the current cell phone coverage as it exists uh, in our area? That's number one. And, and then projected um, uh, maps for the future. And then number two. We have a neighborhood that's not far from us that has one large, like, 93-foot tower or something like that. And since the Wesley neighborhood is targeted for, I don't know, a dozen or two uh, towers, why can't we have one large tower in our neighborhood in one of the green spaces, of which we have plenty? And uh, that should alleviate at least some of the concerns of proximity, and the inverse square law will allow us to feel more comfortable by distance from the radiation, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the sign things. Um, if we can pull up slide 17. Um, okay. So on the first issue of can we get a map that's showing the coverage, we can try to work on something like that. The issue with that is what it is not showing is capacity. So in the past, when you had cell phones, the service was on, or you would notice that you'd have a dropped call. Now, when you look at capacity, what tends to happen is you have things where they slow down. So you may have a web page that comes on your phone, but then it takes a while for all the pictures to load. Or you have a video, and it takes a while to go ahead and buffer. So that is a little bit harder, because the capacity is also driven by if you have certain roads where you have a lot of people who are there at rush hour, so they have a lot of devices and they may be using GPS, streaming music, the kids are watching something. So those can all, so that's a little bit trickier. This slide here is showing you um, rough, roughly, and if we go back one slide, um, okay, so a, a 100 foot tower roughly has a radius of about a mile. A 700, a, a, two, a 20-foot tower roughly has a radius of about 750 feet. Those two things are capable of providing the same amount of capacity. So you could say is that instead of building, if we can go to the next slide, Instead of building 57 new small antennas, I could go ahead and build 57 tall antennas and potentially get there. The issue is two things, really. One is that the targeted approach that you might have is I don't need coverage everywhere. Where I need it can be in certain pockets. Those pockets can also exist because of topography. We have hills and we have valleys, and we have very tall trees. And all of those things on a case-by-case -case basis can make a difference. Some people would like them in open spaces. Some people would like to make sure that we don't have them in open spaces. On the, um, so, the, and, and the issue is, is that there are, the last issue is, is that 5G is really, is two things, it's a, tool, you can take the, the, the way that 5G is roughly working is I'm putting a device closer to the antenna. And that allows me to take spectrum and to take information and it's going like this. 
And the faster that I can hand off and deliver that, I can reuse that spectrum. And that's what a provider is using to get more capacity. As you have more people who are streaming Netflix, watching those things, cutting off and not using Wi-Fi to connect those, but connecting to some other plan, that can impact it. There are other, so you can take what we call 4G technology and you can use 5G tools and turn it into 5G. In addition, there's new spectrum, and I think people mentioned it, that's coming out that's because of, if you've seen the auctions, those of you, when you had a digital television, we've had to move it. If some of you have noticed, some PBS stations have been selling it. All this is part of the federal government kind of moving things around to make more spectrum available. One of the things that they're looking to do is to make spectrum available that doesn't travel as far. So you could have a provider that says, I don't have the ability to use a 100-foot tower because I don't own the spectrum that travels a mile. I only own or have more capacity in the spectrum that travels something like 750 feet. Okay, I'm going to move to the veteran in front. Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Mark King. I'm from Germantown, Maryland. I'm not interested in zoning. I'm not interested in how high the tower is. As a military guy, combat arms officer in the United States Army, I recognize when I can't generate enough combat power to overcome the enemy. So here's what I'd like to see. Um, the, the, uh, these towers, and I happen to be the proud recipient of one right on my front lawn, uh, is that uh, I have concluded that there is a reason to be concerned about the value of my property once this tower is installed. And I suspect it will be installed. So what I would like to see, I'd like to find out if the county has the ability to cause a fund to be created by the cell, t cell tower companies that requires the establishment of a fund for let's say one cent for every dollar collected for the operation of the towers. This fund would be used to compensate homeowners and conversely it could compensate health issues and other issues that arise from this throughout the county who lose value in the property because of the close proximity of a small cell tower. The details of such fund operations could be worked out later. There's no question in my mind that after discussing the issue with a number of realtors in the area that this will affect home property values mostly to the negative and there's plenty of anecdotal evidence on the internet that would support that claim as well. As such, I believe that the county has the responsibility to establish the permitting criteria for the installation of these small towers, then the county bears the responsibility to protect homeowners throughout the county, ensuring that their property values will not be negatively impacted by these actions. So I ask, can the county require the cell phone companies to establish a real estate compensation fund to ensure homeowners throughout the county are financially protected from a reduction in value of their property as a result of this action. Thank you. That, that is something that we would have to further research and probably the most important factor in that is that um, Congress passed the, uh, what is the anti, not taxing of, wireless services, the Internet Tax Freedom Act. So the Internet Tax Freedom Act says that you cannot tax internet serve, provision of Internet service. The issue is for a telecom provider right now, the wireless telephone service that you, if you purchase that, is subject to, I believe it's a $3.50 tax that the county imposes per line on that service. The mobile wireless service, I think it would be difficult to impose something. You'd have to, re this is why I'm saying you have to research it. Because it comes down to the issue of, is it a tax of general applicability, or does it become some kind of fee that could be justified? And that, that would require more analysis on that. But what I would also add is, the issue of what drives a home value up or down or certain things is a complicated and it's typically not easy to isolate that it's one factor. So just in the application of it, it can be difficult. The other piece is that there are also studies that show, and you can see them as well when you see renters in apartment, 
that access to internet service is an important thing. Um, access to fiber, in some cases, there have been some studies out there that show that those improved home values. So it's a balance, I think, definitely between the aesthetics, but also that there are people who are going to be looking for places where they can get service. Okay, um, let me go ahead and um, take uh, the woman right here in the next to Mark. Oh, hold on a second. Thank you for having this meeting Please, tonight. Could you repeat your name one more time? Lisa Klein. Um, and I do appreciate how complicated this, this is. And I do hope there's more of you <laughs> working on this because it requires quite a task force. I wanted to ask you about some strategy um, questions. And I guess I'm speaking for the little people, the kids on whom RF radiation has never been tested. Um, I think it's important to point that out, that the, the testing was only done on a facsimile of a 220-pound male. Therefore, we only know if it's safe within a certain proximity of a big guy. Um, so as far as young people, can you talk to me about exploring setback ordinances? Many communities throughout the country have instituted 2,500-foot setback ordinances for any kind of cell facility. Um, until such time as it is proven safe for kids, which I'm sure it won't be because it's not ethical to test this sort of thing on a child. Um, and then the other strategy question would be compliance. Um, the Wall Street Journal article in 2014, there was a report that said one out of t every 10 facilities was out of compliance with the FCC regulations. FCC said, we simply don't have the resources to check all of the towers. So. Yeah. I guess my question is for the legal expert, how do you write in caveats that say until such time as for the, set, for the safety and then for the compliance, can you have them require that the, the sites are tested daily? I mean, can you set up some barriers that help us um, keep these away from our homes? Lisa, all terrific questions. I would, I would ask you if you had a site to what communities have a 2,500-foot setback. Walnut Creek. I, I think my firm actually represents Walnut Creek. We have an office in Walnut Creek, and that's not, my understanding, that's not a broad across the board um, a setback requirement. But I, we will look at that and share that with the, with, with the county. Um, your, your, your second question. Uh, again, going back to the RF, uh, again, I, I can only tell you that the elected leadership of this county has, has been to the commission and plans to continue to push the commission to get answers for those questions. And to the extent that we can, we'll address it within the, within the powers of the law. I mean, there... Okay, so let me, let me address, and, and I'm going to ask again, just to remind people to try not to... Um, shout out because what happens is, is that we can't we can't pick up the question. The question was about writing in caveats or can we do that? The issue is is that there are some jurisdictions where they have looked and they said they have to be farther from schools, they have to be farther from nursing homes, they have to be farther from these other areas. But in what we were looking at, it also seemed that those were also places where there were a lot of people who wanted to be able to use their devices. Um, so we have not, I mean, so, so we have looked and we are aware of those, but we have not opted to choose those. On the issue of are there other people, I can tell you that besides these people, yes, there are many other people in the county in multiple agencies and zoning who are trying to weigh in on this and we're trying to figure out all the different permutations of it. I'm going to um, come, and I want to again um, ask, If I could yes. just throw oh, one yes. thing in. Just to the question of compliance, um, oh. that's something that we take very seriously. Every single one of the uh, applications in the sites is, is reviewed very closely for, um, you know, what is, what is the level of radiation coming out of it? What is the pattern? Where does it go? And is it in compliance with the FCC rules? Granted, it's the FCC rules, but um, in this case, uh, you mentioned 75 percent. This is 100 percent as far as the, the review and the thoroughness on it. And it's one of the things that the county has made sure is, is very closely watched. I will, I will also add that following last October's meeting that we did go out and do site visits 
um, to, to look at the compliance in the field and those uh, antennas were in compliance and we can look at finding ways to um, make that data more available. I'm gonna come down in front and I wanna give us a note that we have about 18 minutes. So, and let me get say that it is, this is a live television, so we're going to stop at, at, the, at 9 o'clock. My name is Jerry Goss, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Seven Lock Civic Association, Inc. One of our major concerns is the additional weight on the existing wooden poles. Many of them are 50, 60, or 70 years old. We see that tonight there's a forecast of gusty winds and heavy rain, gust of 30 to 50 miles an hour. Uh, they say scattered tree and power line outages. How many more power line poles will fall? We saw that a loss of electricity in most of Puerto Rico now with more than 80 or 85 percent without electricity. We don't want this to happen in our county. You can't keep adding weights of fiber optic lines, of telephone lines, of cable lines. You keep adding weight. These poles can't take it unless we have some new requirements to say that the poles will be tested. 50-year-old poles can't take an additional couple of hundred pounds on there. We have serious problems with our old poles. They've never been replaced. Thank you. All right. Okay, so let me, uh, let me answer that. Um, the, the issue there is, is that right now when it goes through the Transmission Facilities Coordinating Group, TFCG or the Tower Committee, they look to determine that everything that is being attached will meet the current wind safety ratings. I believe those are at the G standard, the Rev G standard, and they have to be at, a, it's either 75 or 90 miles an hour is what they have to be able to withstand. There is a site visit that goes out to each of these areas. So if there was an issue in which you might have a pole um, that looks like it needed some issue, they, they could require that there be a structural analysis to determine that it could hold it. In the case of utility poles, those poles are also managed and owned by the utility company. And typically the utility companies themselves have had requirements where you may have to replace a pole if you're adding more lines and they don't think it can hold the weight or if you are adding additional equipment. So there's a couple different checks of people who are looking to make sure that that happens. I'm gonna go to- but, um, Mitz, I just have to take a point of personal privilege and that is I'm a member of the Seven Locks and I'm proud to have you here representing us. Okay, I'm gonna take the woman in the middle in the black and then Rick will go to you next. Good evening, I'm Megan Montgomery. I'm a resident of Montgomery County and I too thank you for holding this hearing. Um, it really seems like we're looking for a solution that does not have a problem. I have been telecommuting for a number of years. I used to own a consulting firm. I have never ever heard anyone say they can't move to Montgomery County for lack of internet access service now. I would, I would also like to note that there is absolutely nothing that we have heard here tonight compelling the county to act in any manner on this issue right now today and we have heard no evidence at all that the county's actions are going to do anything to slow or stop the potential threat of future regulations from the state or the feds. This is just simply the government showing up at our doorstep going, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And that scares people to death. So I would really urge the county to consider either spending this effort and obvious lots of, of, of people time and, and money and, 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 you know, and, and resources to, to better empower the council to, to affect the will of the people that are sitting here tonight. Okay. So a couple, one, one. Uh, let me let me take one one point of address. This we have met with the industry and in addressing, particularly in the state of Maryland, because what you see is um, both with um, in the history of cable franchising and telecom taxes, and in um, the small cell regulation and preemption area. What tends to happen is is that you see uh, industry moving to preempt at the state level because they haven't had as much, I mean, nothing's really getting done in Congress that much. So they've moved to the states. So 
What we are concerned about is the Maryland legislative session opens again in January. Industry has can't come to us. We, I mean, frankly, I think there's two things happening. I think that one, in the past, we've done a good job of organizing on various things and, and educating our delegation and working with other areas. I think that you also have a certain number of rural dele delegates from rural areas who are starting to recognize that if you just preempt what Montgomery County and Prince George's County can do, that doesn't necessarily mean that wireless services are gonna come to the other areas. But that said, if the industry can come back and say, look, preemption at the state level is needed because we've worked in Montgomery County for a year and we cannot reach any kind of local solution it lends more fodder to the idea that preempting local governments is the solution. And that's what we are trying to work towards, avoiding. But, but all of us in Montgomery County standing here waiting to be slaughtered to prove to some rural county that we may have a solution that involves us being literally. <laughs> the, so I, the, I'm sorry, if I'm, I, that's not what I intended and if that's, if that's the issue. You know, what, I'm sim what I'm simply saying is there are some, in the various federal filings and things that you see, you will see industry filings which say, we have to preempt local zoning so that we can bring broadband to all Americans. And we filed comments saying that that is a deeply disingenuous premise to suggest that if you preempt urban areas, that's suddenly going to mean that you're going to have wireless services in rural areas. But what they are counting on is that the one place that you are likely to see more broadband legislation in Congress is specifically focused on rural. So it's a marketing pitch in which they've talked about it that way. What I'm simply saying is at the Maryland level, why we haven't seen legislation that was introduced last time may be in part because rural delegates know that just preempting in urban areas is not necessarily going to lead to a boon in those areas. But again, what we are trying to do is to have a, a strategy in which we are proactively looking to see how can we manage and have compatible deployment in our neighborhood? How can we find ways in which we meet the federal shot clock requirements without preempting um, the ability for people to have say, particularly where we have new antennas in there? All right, I'm gonna move to the gentleman. Let us fight at the state level. Let us go to Annapolis and fight there. Okay. Don't bring it to Montgomery County. All right, thank you. Okay. So again, we have about 11 minutes, so I'm gonna to move to the gentleman in the back in the red shirt. Right here. <laughs> My name is Dan Kaiser. Um, just a quick question. So for these cell tower deployments, I guess the DAS deployments, direct antenna. Distributed antenna Distributed systems. antenna systems. So they're pretty much, so in Montgomery County, They'll probably be, what, 500 feet from each other? So every 500 feet, there'll be an antenna in Montgomery County. That's the end goal, I believe, for well, 5G coverage so, throughout the county. Well, okay, so it, so here's a couple things. It, and I will honestly say it depends. It, it, it be because these, the different providers, it's my belief in, from our conversations with them, that they're each trying out different models. They don't have a fixed set. So in some cases, you'll have one provider who says, I want to try using a DAS network. For somebody else, you're going to say, I want to find a way to get more coverage in a dense area like Silver Spring or Bethesda. So it is not a uniform. It is likely that as we move to having more things like self-driving vehicles and other types of, OK, but. But as you have other types of applications which become very dependent on, I have to track something and never lose track of it, you might see some of those types of things. But it's not clear 
whether that's the only solution or whether some of these other ones. So could it be a mix, like say for example, yes. North Potomac, 21 towers, I believe, DAS towers. The I'm not sure if they're shared towers or they're 60, 60, 61 in North Potomac. I'm not sure if those are all shared towers or they're all dedicated. Like so in most cases in that area, they are shared and they will okay. encompass more diff um, more than one provider. But it's possible that Verizon, for example, can have their own tower if they pass the hypothetical community yes, review, it's, it's correct? Po so, so part of the issue is in the past when we had taller um, antennas, we mandated co-location. The issue is on the smaller poles is that if you mandate co-location of of more things, then you en may end up with e larger equipment. It it is yes, most likely going to be a mix because the other thing is some providers own spectrum that travels very far distances, and other providers own spectrum that travels a shorter distance. So depending on who it is, I'll give you one more. Quick follow-up there. So it's possible that North Potomac would have more than 61 cell towers, either DAS, shared, standalone, small cell. It's possible, correct? It, I mean, and then North Bethesda, Okay, so, so for Kensington. some of these, okay, so here's the thing is, for I mean, some of these, anything is possible, but what is feasible? 80% of the applications that we have coming into the county for wireless antennas are from the four major carriers. So when you reach a point where you either have all four carriers have that coverage or you have a provider in which they're not particularly, they don't see any coverage capacity issues. Yes, it's theoretically possible that may be more things that are built there, but it's not that likely unless something else changes. Okay, I'm gonna say that in the, in, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut that one off. And so we've got about seven minutes. What I'm gonna ask is, is there anybody here who has not come to a previous community meeting who has a question? All right, let me go to the gentleman in the front here. Hi, my name is Gary Churlin. I live in Park Overlook. I have a question as to whether we can protect ourselves. If we feel threatened by this radiation for whatever reason, whether we think it's rational and someone else doesn't, can we, for instance, put up a reflector 10 feet from the pole or five feet from the pole that's at 17 feet off the ground and protect our homes and the children in them and uh, the people that live there? I'm gonna ask Or can we insist that, that the pole in front of our house be directional and whatever's inside that equipment, point away from our homes. So um, again, that's, that's part of, I remember that when um, Mitzi was going through the categories of things that are going to be requested, one of them is, why did you pick this location and so forth? And that's one of the things that, that we'd be looking at. Like, so if you have this here, you had a playground, you've got other, other sorts of things like that. It's definitely something that we'd want to understand why it was, why it was placed there and not, not someplace else. As far as what you personally could put up, if you want to put up mylar in your house or whatever, whatever it is that you want to do, I mean, I, these are all things that are permitted. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't, is other than you, the right, you, it's not illegal to put things up to keep the signal from coming in. It would be illegal to try to interrupt the signal. So you couldn't do a cell phone jammer that, that there's been litigation on that. I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous that a number of, uh, a number of, of jails tried to use cell phone jammers and they were found to be violating the rules. You know, so, I mean, yes, yeah, so, some, some of the time, some of the results are, are ridiculous. Okay, and the gentleman right next to you. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Chung. I live in the uh, Wesley neighborhood in North Potomac. I live in the Wesley neighborhood in North Potomac, and there is um, a cell tower proposed about five feet from uh, my front yard. My kids play there every day, and there is also a popular community walkway that's three feet from that tower where people, dozens of people walk on that path daily. Um, two questions. One is, we've been talking about You've been using that phrase about uh, we cannot prohibit service to the area. But right now we already have service in our North Potomac, our Wesley community. We're not prohibiting any service by denying these 5G towers. We already have excellent service according to Verizon by their coverage map. So you keep using that argument saying, oh, we can't do anything about it because it's we're prohibiting that service, but we're not. So I, I would suggest the tower committee push back to Verizon and Cas Crown Castle and say, hey, why don't you look for other places that are really undeserved, un underserved. Peter, who, yes. who, who wants to put the tower up? 
you, you automatically said that you have good service from Verizon. Is it Verizon it that's is asking? Verizon Crown Castle, yes. You, the tower committee needs to push back to your to the industry and say, hey, why don't you do a more thorough research and give us other communities that really need these towers? Because right now in the North Potomac, we're an affluent neighborhood. I think most people have very good internet service already, 4G and broadband. So I think you guys are just using this argument, oh, we, we can't do anything about it because it's, we're prohibit, but we're not prohibiting it if we deny it in these, in this, at least in our North Potomac okay. area. So let me, so let me um, kind of try to address that. The, the, the issue about digital equity is, is an important one. Right now, the, the, when we had cable franchising, local governments in the statute allowed us to say that eventually you have to serve everyone. And the telecom law was set up distinctly different in which it was, well, let the industry go out and serve and it'll be great. So we don't have the same tools in which we may say, we can look at in our analysis if we look and we identify places or more likely that we have complaints from people about areas. That can be something that we may go to industry and ask, what are you doing in this area? But it tends not to be something that we say, well, why don't you not do this and go someplace else? Right now, I, right now, I don't believe our county committee is doing the due diligence and pushing back on these technical requirements. There really is no okay. significant gap. <laughs> All right, and one, one other thing that we will, and I'm gonna move on because we only have a couple minutes left. I'm gonna move Regarding, on. Regarding, going back to what your comment earlier about the, uh, the property devaluation, you said it's hard to pin down. Well, Department of Housing and Urban Development states that cell towers affect property. They require certified appraisers to take the presence of nearby cell towers into consideration when they appraise our property. The guidelines that the HUD, uh, they categorize cell towers as hazards and nuisances, and there's writing that says the HUD prohibits FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, underwriting of mortgages for homes that are within the engineered fall zone of a cell tower. So there's, there's obvious <laughs> HUD yeah. language so, saying so that it does. Okay, so it affects I mean, our I'm property gonna values. Okay, so I'm going so I'm I'm to stop values. you in the interest of time so I can get one last question, but I want to address that and say, and I want to address that and say that we will, okay, we, we, will, we will take a look at that, but what I will also say is that those cell towers and things that they are talking about are the macro, macro towers, towers in most cases that we were talking about. So let me go, because we've only got a couple minutes left. I'm going to try to get another question right here in the gray. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jenna Art. Um, I've been a resident of Montgomery County for uh, 17 years. Um, 17 years ago, I came from Russia, where uh, freedom and uh, the respect of uh, private property, et cetera, is non-existent. So uh, I was under the impression that uh, our private property is sacred, right? Isn't that correct? Isn't that the United well, States of America? Well, it's, it's not. It's not. Is there a question in there? It's, <laughs> yes, it's there, not is. A, it's, there is. There are um, ways in which we. It's not an absolute right. Okay. So <laughs> electromagnetic fields is the new smoking. Okay, it is very harmful. We don't know this yet. Okay, 50 years ago, doctors used to advertise camel. Okay, it right. used to be perfectly healthy. So, in about 50 years, when we finally realize how dangerous and how uh, harmful uh, electromagnetic fields are, it's going to be too late. We already have a lot of people. Every other person has an autoimmune disease in this country. What is happening? I mean, we can't be uh, around electromagnetic fields 24-7. This is, uh, this is okay. ridiculous. I don't use microwave. My cell phone has right. a special case that prevents electromagnetic radiation, okay? Mm -hmm. I turn off my router every single night, and I work from home. I'm actually in IT. I'm a web developer. So I work from home, and so does my husband, and we are perfectly fine the way that things are. We have perfect internet connection, but you guys are driving us away from this county. You said that you want to bring young professionals here. Right. You're driving us away. We are starting to look at properties in Frederick County because okay. we can stay here. All right. And we, 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 have, we have a beautiful right. house. I it's wanna... over half a million dollars, and we have to sell it ASAP because we are scared that we're going to lose property value, and we're going to get even sicker. Okay. All right, I, I appreciate your comments. I'm gonna have one last question, a gentleman in the, in the blue blazer, and I think that's the last one, and I think yeah. we have about 90 seconds yeah, for it. Yeah, about, just about. Thank you, Mitzi. Mel Toll uh, from Montgomery Village. 
and I, I commend you for addressing this through zoning. There are other levels in the county code, as you said, the construction codes, and in fact, operating rules through a, a variety of things. And as you get to adding on those layers after dealing with this, and I understand there's a bit of futility sense about this is going to happen, but are we going to do any monitoring? The uh, county's been monitoring air pollution, water pollution, things like that over the years. <clears throat> when you have uh, WSSC checks the water out of your tap uh, in a swimming pool, they check the pollution almost hourly. What's the county going to do about Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to say that that is a fair question and that we should look to see can we do some type of monitoring or compliance and look to see what the feasibility is of that. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Again, um, you can reach us. Uh, there is information that we put out of the different websites and on the rebroadcast of this, we'll put the website on there. You can reach us right now. You can find all the information on the county's website forward slash towers. Thank you again, everyone.